Okay, so let's start with the first topic of the course, um, which are affine varieties. And these uh, really fulfill this slogan that uh, algebraic geometry studies solution sets of systems of polynomial equations in finitely many variables. Because affine varieties are exactly this, they're these solution sets um, when we impose some polynomial equations um, on some set of variables. And to give an example, um, we can look at um, the solution set of a system with just one equation, but in two variables. And this is the good old equation x squared plus y squared equals 1. And the first observation I want to talk about is that the solution set really depends on what values we allow for these variables. And so here are the first three examples. So we could say maybe we just look for integer solutions of this equation. So x, y are both allowed to be in z. And then, um, well, all the possible values form this kind of grid pattern. And then we see there's a bunch of values which um, where the equation is satisfied. So for example, for 0, 1, um, this is the solution because 0 squared plus 1 squared equals 1. Similarly, 1, 0. And then you can also have negatives of these two. But for example, if you plug in 0, 0, then 0 squared plus 0 squared is 0. This is not equal to 1 in the integers. So this is not a solution. So in fact, we just get these four solutions. That's one possibility. We can be a bit more generous. And we can say maybe we allow real values for x and y. And then this is the classical picture um, that one knows maybe even from school. Um, that the solution set just exactly gives the unit circle in the plane around the origin, like this. And then less obviously, what happens if we allow uh, complex numbers? Um, and it turns out, well, here, I can't really draw the ambient space. The ambient space is c to the four, uh, c squared, which is r to the 4. So it's a four-dimensional real space. And it turns out, um, the solution set of this equation there um, as a, say, topological space looks like a sphere, which is missing one point, like the North Pole is missing. So in the end, topologically, it's basically like, a, um, like an open disk. And, um, and that is not really obvious from this equation. And and of one of the things that um, one can learn in algebraic geometry is how to see this. And then also how to see, like, if we change the equation, maybe have an equation of higher degree, what will be the solution set? OK, so these are three examples. And I wanted to point out there's, there's more exotic things that we can allow for x and y. So for example, we could <clears throat> allow x and y to be in the finite field with three elements. And the equation x squared plus y squared equals 1 still makes sense if we interpret this 1 as the element 1 bar um, in this field. And then we see, well, for x and y, we just have three possibilities, the three elements of the field. And then if we take 0 bar plus 1 bar, then we get 1 bar. That's still right. Um, but for example, uh, if we take 0 bar squared plus 2 bar squared. So 2 squared is 4 modulo 3 is 1. So actually 2 bar squared is also 1 bar. And then this is also a solution, similarly here. And then these three I give um, 1 bar plus 1 bar equals 2 bar, which is not equal to 1 bar. Okay. So here we just kind of exhausted all the possibilities. And then we saw we get a solution set, um, which is now very discrete in nature. And um, all of these are studied. Uh, so all these four possibilities are studied in different parts of mathematics. Like if we look for integer solutions, then these are these uh, Diophantine equations, and they appear in number theory. But as you can guess, maybe these are actually quite hard. So for example, Fermat's last uh, uh, theorem uh, said something about x to the n plus y to the n equals to z to the n looking for solutions for this. And I mean, that's a very hard problem, which was solved using very elaborate techniques. And so in this course, this will be a bit too hard for us. Um, 
Similarly here, if we allow real solutions, a priori this is very familiar to us. We have done uh, probably a lot of things in, in real um, n-dimensional space. But um, this also has some issues. So for example, this is the solution of x squared plus y squared equals one. And that's a nice circle. But then if we change the parameters a bit, for example, if we look at x squared plus y squared equals minus one, then, I mean, the squares of, of real numbers are non-negative. So actually this cannot have any solution. The solution is the empty set. But then um, that's already not very informative, this empty set. Um, and, and then if we change the parameter a bit, for example, if we um, look at x squared plus y squared equal to minus two, we get the same solution set. So there's, there's an entire regime for the parameters where the solution set doesn't depend on the exact equation. And again, that's very not so nice because we want to have a very tight relationship between the equations and the solution set. And, um, and it turns out the best setting is the one here. Um, where we yeah, have the complex numbers and we can be a bit more generous and say, well, for now we restrict to solution sets over an algebraically closed field. So K equal K bar, like the complex numbers. And it turns out for various reasons, this is the right um, setting, which has, has many nice properties to get us started. And, and I guess the hint is that an algebraically closed field by definition has the property that any um, equation in one variable, which has degree at least one, um, has uh, a solution. That's the that's the finding property of um, of being an algebraically closed field. And if we are looking at systems of equations, and it's certainly nice that we have an assumption on on our base field, which tells us that in one variable with one equation, um, we have as nice a behavior as possible. Um, when looking for solutions. So that's the reason that from now on, we restrict to the setting of an algebraically closed field. And then we can come to kind of main definition of the course, uh, namely what is our, of this uh, lecture, which, namely which uh, is like, what is an affine variety? And um, we start by defining the, the ambient space in which this sits. And there we say, that an, um, the affine n space over our base field k, is just um, the collection, the, the set of all collections of n numbers in the field k. So um, a priori, it seems a bit strange that we give this an, um, its name on its own because, as I said, it's just isomorphic to k to the n, like n tuples of elements in k. But um, as we're going to see later. We start giving this set extra structure. So for example, we give it a structure of a topological space and so on. And then it's nice to have a proper symbol for it because I mean, for just for K to the N, it's not clear a priori what topology it has. So this is the ambient affine N space. And then we look for um, um, solutions of systems of equations. So that means if we have a subset S, inside the polynomial ring in n variables, then we can see these S, um, these elements of S as uh, polynomial equations by saying that we look for the set of solutions so for the set of elements in our affine n space, such that all the polynomials satisfy f of x equal to zero. So at this point, is a solution to all the equations f equals to zero when f runs through the set s. And this we call um, the zero locus of the set s. We write it vs. V in this case stands for vanishing locus, which is another name. And um, these are the solution sets we talked about before. And then subsets of a n which have this form so that there exists some set s of equations um, which write them as the as the vanishing set um, subset of this form we call uh, affine varieties. And uh, I should say that um, other um, sources sometimes call these things um, affine algebraic subsets or affine algebraic sets. Um, but we follow here the the conventions in the in the notes of Gutman and call them affine varieties. 
Okay. And um, just as a convenient notation, sometimes um, we, I mean, very often we will look at um, solution sets of just finitely many equations. And then instead of always writing the set signs here, um, we also allow ourselves to just write V of F1 comma and so on up to Fn. Okay. And um, after giving a definition, we should also look at some examples of such sets some very basic properties. So um, let's get the trivial ones out of the way first. So if you have as a single equation, just the equation 0 equals 0, well, you see the variables don't appear. This equation is always true. So all the points x and a n are solutions to this very boring equation. And so a n is the vanishing locus of this, um, of this single equation. So we can get the entire space. This is an example of such an affine variety. And uh, similarly, on the opposite end, we can ask the equation 1 equals to 0. And this is never satisfied in our base field. And so no matter what point x we choose, um, the equation will always be false. And therefore, the solution set is just the end set. So we can get these kind of two extremes. Well, that wasn't very instructive, but um, let's let's slowly go to slightly more interesting examples. Um, the next one is just that if you have any point in affine space, then you have a single element set, which just contains this one point. And the claim is you can write this as the solution set of a system of equations. And now you do need several equations. And the equations that you impose is just that the first coordinate x1 should be a1, the second coordinate x2 should be a2, and so on, until you say um, the coordinate xn should be a n. And uh, remember here, this, this polynomial means xn minus a n equals to 0. That's exactly uh, forcing the nth coordinate to be a n. And so after imposing these equations, you have narrowed down um, all the all the coordinates to a single value, and therefore you can get as a solution set exactly this one point set. So um, at, at least we can get this one point set like this. Um, and then the simplest types of equations are linear equations. So where the polynomial is just a, a linear combination of the xi plus a constant term. And, um, and then Clearly, if we have any linear subspace of a n equals k to the n, where now it really is a linear subspace of this vector space, then we can cut this out by linear equations. I mean, it's a co-dimension one space. Then there's actually um, basically one equation cutting it out, um, unique up to scaling. And then um, if we if we have higher and higher co-dimension, we need more and more uh, such equations. And then finally, um, a kind of hint at, at the first construction, which takes several uh, fn varieties and constructs a new one. Well, if you have x in a n and y in a m, some affine varieties, then you can just look at the subset x cross y inside the product of these two affine spaces. And the product of these affine spaces is just k to the n plus m, which is, again, an affine space. And the claim is this is actually also an affine variety. And this, this I want to leave as an exercise here. But the idea is, while well, you have one set of equations cutting out x in here and one set cutting out y in here. And then you should come up with a system of equations which cuts out their product in the product of these spaces. Okay. So um, let's leave that as an exercise. And these were the kind of basic examples and just, um, just to conclude, I wanted to show some more fancy examples because you can actually get very nice um, geometric shapes out of these. And um, the, the issue over the complex numbers, um, well, the solutions behave nicely, but drawing them is a bit uh, hard because the ambient space um, will be a high dimensional real space. But what we can do, at least for these pictures, is we can draw what the real solutions are. So in other words, we can intersect the solution set uh, with r to the n. And then uh, for like two and three um, uh, variables, we can draw uh, the solution set. And so here 
if you take the equation uh, y squared minus x to the 3 plus 3x three minus 3, then you can um, so you see two variables, x and y. So we have an ambient two-dimensional space. And then the solution set is a very nice um, smooth curve like this. And, um, and then in, in three variables here, x, y, z, if you impose these three conditions, then you get a nice um, smooth curve running through this uh, three-dimensional space. And here we see an interesting um, phenomenon already, because if you start with a three-dimensional space, r to the three, and you impose three equations, you would expect that this cuts out um, just a finite solution set because you have three degrees of freedom and then three equations. But here we see the solution of these three, um, uh, these particular three equations is a one dimensional thing, curve. And this hints at the fact that these equations aren't entirely um, independent from each other. But the interesting thing in this particular example is that if you leave out any one of those, then you get a strictly bigger solution set. So none of them is really redundant, but also they're not totally independent in the sense of cutting down the dimension by one each. So um, the, next, uh, uh, the next part of the lecture will study uh, this phenomenon of like how do the solution sets depend on these equations and we're going to start um, uh, seeing this relationship further.